have the incredible honor of speaking to an incomparable artist, a fabulous person, and a dear, dear, dear friend. And that is soprano Janina Burnett. Now, some of you know Janina, but uh, she is such an accomplished and an incredible artist and one of the few artists on the planet to be able to say that they have sung roles on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera and the Broadway stage, the Great White Way. So please put your hands together, shake your phones a little bit, and welcome my dear sister friend, Janina Burnett. Uh, hey! Hello. How are I'm you? So, I'm good. I'm so happy to be here with you this evening. Oh my goodness, it's so great to be here with you too. I'm sending you all the hugs that I would give you in real life if we were so together. To you too. <laughs> so how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing well, honestly. Yeah? Yes, how... I've had a lot of time to myself. Yeah. And quite beneficial. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of time to just reflect and hear what that inner voice is saying um, and hear what she's singing. And um, so it's really, really been beneficial to be here and in my home. <laughs> yes. The first time. So I'm well. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. So how long has it been? Because I remember... I think being with you at your house was the last time I was outside communing with people. <laughs> we have um, a lot of our friends jumping on. I see Chauncey's here. And I see Kevin Miller. And Kevin Miller is probably eating as he's watching. We know he's eating. I'm no sure. doubt. No doubt that he's eating. Uh, <laughs> and Enrique is here. It's so great to see all of you. So part of this um, live series that I wanted to do um, is to let the, the, the world know mm -hmm. that we as opera singers are also real people. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of different sides and facets to us, but also to talk about this amazing documentary that is being made about six of the greatest legends to ever walk this planet, and five of whom are still with us. And so we're going to get into talking about them a little bit later. But I want you to tell the folks who may not know, where are you from? How did the music bug get you? Uh, and yeah, just talk about that. Okay. Um, well, I'm originally from Los Angeles, California. Um, yes, and my my mom is from Philadelphia, <laughs> and my my grandmother uh, is actually a mus was a musician. She was a pianist and a cellist, um, and my father is actually a jazz musician. So okay. he's a drummer. He is um, a jazz legend. He's played with Freddie Hubbard. He's played with Horace Silver and many many other um, countless jazz musicians. And so I grew up in that kind of, in that environment. Um, I was surrounded by the best musicians all the time. And, uh, you know, jazz was, is my homeland is what I say. Um, and as I grew, grew up in that, I, found, I was involved in many things. I love to dance, I love to ice skate, but singing seemed like the thing that just, I would always do. That's like yeah. I came to the planet singing. Um, so I uh, allowed my light to shine through my voice. And so my mother and father, they cultivated it. I went to a, uh, a performing arts high school, I took voice lessons. Um, and, you know, I always wanted to be able to sing anything with my voice. That was something that I said, you know, I was like, if I'm, I want to be able to sing anything, I don't care what it is. Um, so I, you know, joined the choirs, I sang with the magical singers and I sang with the jazz ensemble. The jazz ensemble was the most familiar to me because my dad, uh, my dad's influence and that influence on my life. Um, so that kind of was my gateway into, um, opening the doors to my musical world. 
So when it came time to go to college, um, I was very clear that I wanted to go to Spelman. Um, I knew that in the seventh grade when the Cosby show was on and when A Different World was on and it looked like it was so much fun and they were learning, the young people were, their minds were cultivated by um, information about them, about people that looked like them. Um, and at that time, um, Spelman was, and this time too, Spelman was really making a big imprint in just in, in the community in America, in the States. So I was very clear that that was where I wanted to go. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there were some other options. My school was very, um, it, it, my, my dad went to USC and my mom taught at USC for a while. And USC was very much involved in my high school. Um, it was like my high school was a feeder into uh, USC. Um, so I was like, I don't want to go there. <laughs> but um, Berkeley College of Music was also an option. Um, as, I weighed, as I weighed my, you know, thinking about music schools and what I wanted to do, um, I wanted to sing jazz. I wasn't sure that I was going to do opera at that time. Um, but Spellman was always in the back of my mind. And I was just like, whatever they have there, I'm going to see what it is. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, fast forward and I, I got into it. And when I, I got there my freshman year, these young sisters that came in with me could all sing classically. They, a lot of them had gone to the Duke Ellington School of the Arts in DC. I had yeah. seen people who looked like me singing like that. That was the first time for me so in your in your uh, performing arts high school in LA, was there not um, a large number of black students or was there not a focus on classical music there? No, the focus was on um, Broadway and musical theater. Um, mm. And, and uh, then there was the jazz ensemble as well. And then the magical singers. So it wasn't necessarily a push toward opera at all. It was it was like a theater into to the Broadway world into musical gotcha. theater, or, you know, more or less. Um, so at that point, I wasn't necessarily that interested in musical theater. I, so I, the journey, I decided to, to go. But when I got to Spelman, um, because of my peers, like classical music was at the forefront of the curriculum. However, they did mm -hmm. have a jazz ensemble. And I was like, oh, I'm going to definitely be in that. You know, I'm going to, you know, take advantage of everything that this school has to offer. Yeah. Um, I was really inspired by my friends and my peers who could sing classically and just make the most glorious sounds. And they inspired all of us. All of the whole music department at that time was really inspired by that class that had come in. And that included, um, let's see, Samaya Ali, Terry Vincent, Cherie Smith. Um, let's see, you know, there were a lot of people who they really, and Kirsten, Kirsten Brown, um, they all just, really inspired me. Um, and so there was a real focus on classical music. So the, the department kind of began to raise up and cultivate these new wonderful artists that they had coming in. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, I want to do that too. I want to be cultivated. <laughs> <laughs> so our music teacher, Mrs. Laura English Robinson, she um, was our teacher and she made sure to lay a very firm foundation for us that we continue to stand on on the uh, on this day in the state and you know it's interesting every time i see miss laura i tell her um i don't know what you were doing in your studio teaching but all of my black girlfriends that study with you can sing the walls down i don't know what miss laura does in that studio but it was something special so yeah. can you talk about what um, having her uh, in your life at that time as a young woman um, away from home in a new school and people are seeing classical music and you have this beautiful black woman showing and leading the way. What was that like? Well, again, for me, since I was coming from a jazz background, it took me a while to really get, and I'm coming from California as well, where everything goes. Uh, you know, California is very free and laid back. Um, and, you know, we wear white after Labor Day. I mean, there's not, <laughs> you know, we do it all there. 
So coming to a more conservative, straight-laced um, place um, was an adjustment for me, I must admit. Um, but she was patient with us, and she was patient with me as we just, I tried to <laughs> figure out everything, you know, coming in and figuring out how this new environment, you know, the South, all of these elements, you know, how they, you know, hit us. She was patient as, as she allowed us to, to develop. Um, I will say that in addition to our lessons from which I've gathered so much information, what really helped was working with my peers, like going in the practice room with Samaya and Terry and saying, hey, how do you make that sound? What are you doing? Mm. What, what happens when you, when you do, how do you do that? What are you thinking? And I remember them just saying, okay, well, I just do this. And I could see the sound in their mouths. And I, I was like, I could just soak everything up you know, what they were telling me. Um, and I practiced. I practiced what my sisters gave me and I practiced what Miss Robinson gave me. Now, added to that, the jazz department, the jazz ensemble was such a wonderful benefit to my cultivation as a musician as well. Mm -hmm. um, because um, again, there were also other sisters there who were so, um, just accomplished and so talented that it just inspired me immensely. Yeah. Tia Fuller, Ramona Estelle, they, Tia Fuller is a, you know, Grammy nominated saxophone player, you know, who played with Beyonce and she teaches at the Berklee College of Music. And she was another who inspired my development as a musician and as an artist, um, just from listening, listening, you know. So Miss Robinson was definitely at the center of this, of my learning, but mm -hmm. I must say that it was, my learning was also cultivated, my artistry and my development was cultivated by having people around me who um, were, were driven, um, who were talented, who looked like me, who were inspired, who were excellent and smart yeah. and beautiful. So that really played such a, a big role in my development, development because I knew wherever I went, I would always have a, the awareness that these sisters existed somewhere in the ethers, you know, yeah. and inspired me, you know, could inspire me to. That's see my an, uh, it's an amazing foundation to have, especially coming into the business of the arts, be it you know, opera, jazz, or Broadway, or whatever genre of music you go into, is having that um, experience at an HBCU. I didn't have that experience. And so my college experience was more like the, the eight or nine Black kids that were there. Uh, and from all different disciplines in the conservatory, we would all hang out together. Whereas yeah. with you, you saw it every day. You were in class with them every day. You ate yeah. with them every day. You, it, it's such a tremendous experience, and an experience that I envy at times. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have it with us, with your, your colleagues that love you and that surround you. you know? Yeah, I created it <laughs> outside of school. <laughs> yes. So tell me, um, because I know a little bit about once you left Spelman and then you went to a conservatory up north, yeah. what what clicked and made you want to do that path, going from HBCU to a conservatory to actually study opera and classical music? Um, as I continued to matriculate through Spelman, it became clearer and clearer that there was more that I wanted to learn. Um, and I wanted to see how far it could go. I was always fascinated with the crossroads between jazz and opera. And because jazz was so familiar to me, being that I had been raised in it, I, and, and opera and classical music seemed a bit foreign to me, I wanted to continue on in that, in that direction. Um, it was an interesting choice because I, I did a lot of research. I said, you know, let me look at everything. I, I had to search my heart, first of all, and say, is this what we want to do? But I was very clear. You know, I got the further, as I got further on in Spelman, my senior year, I was very clear that I, I wanted to sing. 
Um, but I researched the institutions to see what spoke to me, you know, what spoke to the kind of artist I wanted to become. Um, and I wanted to become a well-rounded musician. I wanted to become, I, I'm interested in the liberal arts. I'm interested in languages, all of the things that, you know, are a part of opera, <laughs> you know. Um, so Eastman really seemed like the place for me. And it's different because Eastman is actually a school of music, which is a conservatory, which focuses more on performance. And uh -huh. Eastman focuses more on, um, I guess, learning educational elements. Like, like liberal arts college or? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So it just ha so happened that I had a lot of chances to perform while I was there. But it had a very heavy um, educational elements, um, history, um, theory element. Um, but yeah, so after Spelman, I was very, I just got very clear that I wanted to continue on and that there was more for me to learn and that would, there would always be more for me to learn, you know. Um, not to say that there wouldn't always be more for me to learn in jazz, because there definitely is. There, and I'm learning that now. But I want able to fully be fully in control of my instrument and that's what the key was i wanted to continue to be to learn how to be fully in control of my instrument because once you're in control you can do it. and that to be able to do that kind of answer the question <laughs> from Eastman? <laughs> yes. Oh, well, a little bit of fairy dust. <laughs> yes. And I had a teacher tell me that. He was like, this book has fairy dust sprinkled on it, so it'll help you. But, um, so we were doing a production. My second year of my master's, we were doing a production of Bohem there. And yes. I was singing Mimi along with um, Liz Brooks was in it. She's Musetta. And um, Lucas Meacham was Marcello. <laughs> Um, so let's see. Uh, so we were doing that. We were in rehearsals and the show was going up and, you know, it's the second year and you're trying to get out and figure out what the next steps in your life are going to be. And I was like, looking around on the, on the bulletin board, I was like, so what's the next step after you, you know, get your master's? What are you supposed to do? So everybody was like, well, you're supposed to go to a young artist program. So they said, these are the really good ones. So I applied to all of them and began the audition process. Then, so one, one day, one afternoon, I was sitting in front of the library and it was a day that the sun had finally come out to shine because in Rochester it doesn't shine often. And right. <laughs> it was turning and we were sitting in front of the library, me and my friend, Alta Booger, um, and sh someone walked by and was like, oh no, 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 Alta walked by. I was with my friend Melissa. Alta walked by and was like, they've opened, reopened the auditions for, for uh, Blah Boy on Broadway. And everyone kind of heard that there were these auditions happening for Lava Lamb on Broadway, but we had heard horror stories of there being, uh, you know, I had 52 auditions for this show, they don't know what they want, and I've sung many times, you know, and I was just like, oh, and then, they, then I heard that they had closed them, and I was like, oh, okay, that's fine. So she's like, they reopened the audition. My friend Amy just got, got, just got the email from her agent. And uh, she's like, I can let you, I can give you the information if you want. And I was like, hell yeah, I'll take that information. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'll take that information. Mm -hmm. So she s sends me an email and the, the email is very specific. Like, we want you to film yourself sitting in a chair in a dark room with the camera angled to the right and we want you to sing Miki Amo no Mimi, and just really bizarre kind of instructions. And it said, no calls, please. But there was a phone number. So I took the email to my teacher, and my teacher was at the time Carol Weber, and she was like, what should I do? Should I, I'm, I'm interested in doing this. She said, let's call. <laughs> so we called, and I said, I'm Janina Burnett, and you know, I got this, this information, and I'm willing to come down and audition. I can do it in person for you. I know you said don't call, but I'll, I can come down. I'm very close. And the person on the phone was like, mm, 
like she had to talk to someone and she was like, okay, well, well come on down. So me and the other young lady who were playing, who was playing uh, Mimi, we drove down there and did these auditions, you know, um, much to everyone's dismay because they were just like, they've auditioned everybody. They've heard everyone from if anyone, anyone who's other, has auditioned for this show, but they just don't know what they want. So long story short, I did three, four auditions. My mm. third with Baz Lerman, um, in which we just worked together, just him and, him and I, and he filmed me and he directed me and said, what you should feel and how do you feel if you sang the aria this way? And think about this. And he just really encouraged me to dig yeah. in a place in my soul that uh, I didn't know we, one could access when singing. Yeah. Uh, so long story short, he liked me and I was cast <laughs> for that show. And uh, yeah, here we are. <laughs> and it's so interesting, that's where our worlds collided. Mm -hmm, um, I uh, and Enrique said uh, he had eight callbacks to get in the show <laughs> and that's interesting because that's the same amount of callbacks that I had to get in the show right. except uh, Enrique got right in the show and I came to the show six months into the run um, by strange circumstances <laughs> and uh, they they said how soon can you get here and that's all they needed to say. I was on the next bus or train or wherever I was uh, <laughs> and and got there. And I was in rehearsals for a week and then for six hours a day, every day. Yes. And then at night, they had me watch the show every night. Yes. And by the eighth show, I was tired of seeing the show. I was tired of rehearsing. I was just like, let me on. Just yeah. let me do it. I and I was sitting there and I hear this voice from, from Mimi's first entrance. And it was a voice that I had not heard in the other seven performances because there was an Asian Mimi, there was a Russian Mimi, there was a, a, a Caucasian American Mimi. They were all the colors of the Mimis. Mm -hmm. And this was a sound that I hadn't heard. Mm -hmm. And I perked up and I said to myself, that is a black girl. Before I saw you <laughs> and you came out on stage and I was like, oh, oh my God, oh my God. And I remember I ran backstage after and I was like, hello, hello, I'm Kenny Overday, nice to meet you. Da, 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 da. And we've been yeah. brother and sister ever since. Like, it, it was crazy. It's true, it's true, yes. That was such a whirlwind. This is what we're talking about, Baz Lemon's Lava Lemon on Broadway. Rebecca asked which one, which show uh, this was. Um, and it was an interesting thing because it was an anomaly. It was an opera, it was on Broadway. It wasn't governed by equity. It was, a, right. it, weren't, it was just a little, it was very different, <laughs> you know, for the yeah. Um And there was a lot of pushback from the opera community. Um, people were just like, oh, it's not going to do... It. We just heard everything. But those, everything. Everything from, oh, they're going to ruin their voices to, oh, it's just not going to... You know, but uh, it was such... When we were just being in it was one of the most magical experiences of life. Yes. One of the yeah. most, you know. And I learned so much. My friend Patricia Phillips, who was the first Black Carlotta, she taught me the ropes in that show of Broadway. Her, Martin Sola... They were like, this is what, what it is. And I, want, I bring up Patricia because she was the one that said, always keep auditioning for Phantom because that's always going to be open. You know, Angie Lloyd Webber buys out that house. That is a, a long running show. And it's one of the few that has legit singing. So she said, mm -hmm. if you have an audition, you go and stand in the line because that, <laughs> whatever, that's how you get in. You that line and you go and sing for it and um yeah so she's one of the ones that really just held my hand into the into my, my professional life you know yeah. broadway you know but i was there i was very clear that i wanted to do opera that i wanted to explore the fullness of where i could go um, right artistically you know so so then after our run 
on Broadway ended with Bohem, take me to the next steps because y- your career is one that does not follow the common trajectory that most opera singers careers take from uh undergrad to graduate, usually a conservatory, and then young artist program, and then the competition circuit, and then into the career. Mm -hmm. And yours went sort of like that. So tell me, take me from the time La Boheme on Broadway ended, Mm -hmm. and then what was the next step? Okay, so since I was on Broadway, and I knew all the Broadway people, the casting people and stuff, I thought, my next step was to try to land a Broadway show. Because mm. I'm trying to keep, because once you start, you know, financially, you know, you want to keep going. You know, I was independent already. I had my own place. I had all of these things that were independent. So I needed to keep that going. I didn't necessarily, um, I, I didn't want to have jag, a jag that big. <laughs> you know what I mean? I want to Right, keep- yeah. Going. So I kept trying, I auditioned for Broadway. I tried to do that route. Um, I did competitions during the show. Um, yeah. and I, I, I'm not exactly sure at which audition. Some audition I met um, Roger, oh, his last name is escaping me, God rest his soul. But he was casting the Porgy and Bess for, the, um, for Barkheimer. And I met mm. somewhere at an audition for something, and I introduced him to him, and I said, "Yes, I'm one of the Mimis and Boheme." And he was like, "Well, I, you know, cast the, the Porgy and Bess, and if you ever need, uh, you know, to come and work, I'm happy to help you." Um, so as soon as Boheme on Broadway closed, I called him. <laughs> I <heard> yes. Him. <laughs> you know, got collected my unemployment. I was on the hustle. Um, that's one clear thing about me. I'm a, a big hustler. I'm not afraid to have multiple things going at once. I'm going to try every avenue. That's just the way that it works for me. Right. Um, so as soon as it closed, I called him and he said, oh, you're in luck. This summer, we're going to be going to, we're going to have a tour. And um, yes, let's see if we can bring you in for an audition and, and whatnot. Um, so then I auditioned for Barkheimer and then I began to do um, best on that tour. Um, And I would say that that tour was so beneficial to me because I feel like while I was taking voice lessons through during the whole time of Bohem on Broadway, it was singing so frequently on the Barkheimer tour, Bess, um, that I really learned how to, I really learned what it took to sing with an orchestra because we did have mics and the, 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 uh, on Broadway. Um, right. The orchestra was, you know, padded by the keyboard. It wasn't a full triple woodwinds and all that stuff on Broadway. But um, the Barkheimer tour was a full orchestra. So it was there that I really learned how to hone my craft and sing and really dig in and learn what it took, learn what it takes to really be, uh, to do this full steam. And that ignited a fire in me. So after that tour, um, I was auditioning and um, I got with, it was actually Kathy Olson who introduced me to my agent at the time, who was Bernard Uzan. Um, and from there, in my heart, I was like, y'all just give me these auditions and I'll get the job. I'm, that's, I'm very clear about that. And so we had that relationship and that's what happened. So from there, after that tour, I, you know, did a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of different roles domestically and abroad. Um, and just, you know, hustled, hustled out there, you know, from the suitcase, from the suitcase to the house, suitcase to the house and just traveled and went on and on and on. Right. Um, yeah. So that's basically the long and the short of it. So then tell me about getting to the big house. Mm-hmm. at Lincoln Center at the Metropolitan Opera. Um, you know, for a lot of people, not for everyone, but for a lot of people, it is the pinnacle. It is what singers aspire to. It's where you want to be. 
And a lot of society thinks that you need to have that on your your portfolio to legitimize yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and it happened for you. How did it happen? Take me through you getting to that point. Yes. Well, honestly, you had a big role. You played a big role in that. I remember um, I was having, I had an audition to sing for, was it an audition? I remember Willie Waters wanted me to audition for his Lauretta um, at, at um, what was it called? Uh, was it Connecticut Opera? Oh, Connecticut Opera, yeah. Yes. And um, you said, we stood on the corner, we were on the corner of, uh, I think it was like Broadway in 70, 79th or something like that, or 72nd. And you met me and you were like, I know Willie Waters and he's interested in you for this, for, to, to sing this. And I will take your materials. And that time it was like a CD and like my resume. <laughs> I brought to you in a manila envelope and I gave it to you and you said, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to give it to him. And it was that connection. He hired me for that Lauretta. Um, um, and then the next year after working with him on that, the next season, he said, we want you to do Norina and Don Pasquale. And I was so scared. I was like, oh you know, I was like. So, what made what was what was the fear about Norina as opposed to Lauretta? <clears throat> Lauretta was familiar ground. Lauretta was Puccini. You know, I knew my way through Puccini. I knew my way through long lines and leg legato phrases. You know, I was not as I knew my voice could move because I sang Violetta. You know, and I sang you know um, uh, Juliet, but. There was something about Norina that intimidated me. It seemed much more dense. Um, and there were a lot more notes. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. But you said Willie likes to push people that he likes. And he, he likes to push them to, to see what they can achieve. Yeah. So I slept with that score under my pillow. That was one of the few things that I slept with that score under my pillow. I carried it everywhere I went. On the train, I listened to it. I was, we went, went on tour with ASE and I was listening to, I was learning it on, I, you know, I really, that was one of the first times that I really, aside from Violetta, that I ingested a role in that way. Um, yeah. And, it challenged me in the most fulfilling way. Um, and so we did the performance. And then Willie wasn't even conducted, conducting it, which, which was funny. But um, so then came time to do it. And I was ready, honey. I was ready. And I was ready to inhabit Norina. Um, and the process wasn't easy, but we found our way. And then we presented it. And it was, it was wonderful. It was a wonderful display. I let them have it with that. And it, it proved to myself that I could do it, you know? Um, so from that, one of the, uh, one of the characters, David um, Juan was actually in that. He was a young artist at the, in the Met Young Artist Program at the time. So Lenore Rosenberg, who was the artistic liaison at the time, she always goes to see the ship productions that uh, the young artists do, if they're nearby. So she came to a performance. Um, and did you know she was coming? No, I had no idea. It wasn't until after that uh, I found out that she was there. And um, the next few days, she offered uh, two roles uh, at the Met. She offered Musetta to cover Musetta, uh, Musetta and Frasquita. Uh huh. Musetta and Frasquita, yes. So, um, that scared me too. I was scared to <laughs> <laughs> All this talk about fear, this is real. This is the reality, you know? You, you, you don't know that you can do something until you're thrust into having to do it. And then you Absolutely. Rise. And it's through that rising to the occasion, you know, even if you fall on your bum, you know, that you build up the muscles and the fortitude to really continue going, you know? You know, I always say that your greatness is on the other side of fear. Oh, yeah. And so whatever you need to get to the greatness, you, that's what you need to do. So fear is in trouble. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Fear is in trouble. So you get to the big house, and what is it like? The first day of rehearsal, what do you see? What do you feel? What do you hear? What is that like? <laughs> um, it was frightening because it was quite bigger than me. And I just was like, oh my gosh, I can't. But there was so much, it's, it's heavy. You know, it's a heavy thing, you know, and here I am coming in. The only other person that I knew in my realm who had been there was Karen Slack. And so I called her. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody calls Karen. Everybody yeah. calls Karen. I think she's on here tonight, too. Hey, Keith. Hey, Karen. Girl, you got me through. Because I was just like, what did you do? You know, and at that time, it was an interesting vibe. Like, when I first got there, it was... Um, the vibe was interesting because it seemed like everybody was on pins and needles, um, wondering about what would happen or what was next or what, I don't know, but it felt like it was un uncertain. But I remember Pierre Ballet, he took me and the first thing we did was Carmen Fresquita. He took me and the other Mercedes and we worked so hard and diligently on that music. And I felt like I was in school again. And it just, it just, allowed the fear to dissipate and me feel like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. I'm here. And he took me to see my first Wagner. Uh, we saw, um, uh, oh gosh, I forgot which one it was. Uh, Die Valkyrie, we saw. Mm -hmm. And so it just kind of fold, began to fold me into the community of, of the Met. <sighs> and I eventually <laughs> calmed down <laughs> and everything. <laughs> Um, but I learned a lot. I learned a lot from that, that first Carmen thing. And then um, the Musetta, intimidating too. So I was with, I was covering Ainoa Arteta and it was with um, Angela Giorgio. Ooh, and I love wow. Her. I remember she was like, we were, I, I was reading the book, Molto Agitato. I recommend everyone read that book. It's the history of the Met and it's so much juice in there. And uh, it's really a great, a great resource. So I was reading it in rehearsal as I watched, you know, and um, I know it comes over to me and it's just like, you know everything they say about Angela, you know, that's right. That's right. It's true. You know, it's just like, it's true. It's true. So then over comes Angela and, you know, I was dressed to the nine and she was like, oh, I like your tights. Ha -ha. So then she asks, I know something in Italian and she's just, and she, but she asks her, is she covering you or me in Italian? And I answered her. I said, play. And she was like, oh. I was like, yeah, girl. Don't try it. <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> Don't try it, ma'am. I cool, you know. <laughs> I understand you, ma'am. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> great. It was great. It was um very telling, very telling. So the rehearsals and um just feeling, you know developing my confidence to walk through those halls and say, hey, I belong here, I'm here, and I'm ready, you know? Absolutely, yes. So now talk to me about, um, because you know Instagram, they give you an hour on this platform, so I'm trying to get everything in. I got us on the timer, we good. Okay. But um, I want to talk about, a little bit about the big reason why we're here, which yeah. is the Black Opera film, which is honoring the careers of Simon Estes, Leontine Price, Grace Bumby, Martina Arroyo, George Shirley, and the late great uh, Jesse Norman. And you were one of my closest friends and one of the first friends to donate to the crowdsourcing campaign. And I want to know from you what moved you, possessed you, or inspired you to do that? And how have any of those careers of these legends inspired and affected you? Um, well, you know I love you. So anything that you're a part of, I'm, I support. Um, but also the fact that um, these artists, you know, paved the way for us and we walk in their faithful footsteps. I think it's important that their stories be told, just like we're telling stories here. As my mother so wonderfully told me, 
that stories build community. We must know the stories of one another. Uh, we must know the stories of those who have come before. We do not want to forget those things, lest we forget who we are. Um, so I think it's very important that uh, the world celebrates and knows the stories of these artists, what it took for them to get there, how, how the path ebbed and flowed and allowed for them to become names that we know. Um, I think that's just so important. Um, and I'm here for that and I support that. I support that among the artists now and in the future, <laughs> those that come and in the past. So I completely support that. You know, and I have had the fortune of working with Miss Grace <laughs> um, and talking to George Shirley. And one of the things he said to me was, I said, I'm walking in your faithful footsteps. And he said, make your own. <laughs> wow. You know, I think about the faithful footsteps that were paved. That's important. So knowing and understanding that gives me the courage and, again, the fortitude to make my own, you know, for the next group of people to walk through or for even the people who are on the sides of me to walk through, you know. Absolutely. To, you know, so that means a lot to me. You know, I don't take that. Amazing. And thank you for that. And thank you just for for being you and being honest uh, and being so so generous. Uh, it's a it, it's a real quality. It's not put on just for this interview here, which then brings me to Janina, the activist through her artistry. Um, one of the other big parts of the documentary and why we chose these particular people is because they sang through the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. They were on the biggest stages through the marches that Dr. King was taking, through the assassination of Kennedy, through the assassination of Malcolm X, through the assassination of Dr. King. And to be able to be on stage all over the world and to be a black artist and to sing through those times, we wanted to get those stories out of their mouths. Yes. And so I think that in America now, we are seeing civil rights movement part two oh, in yeah. a very, very big way. Oh, yeah. And you are one of the leading artists out there that uses your artistic platform to tell the stories of our people. Where does that come from for you? What inspires you to do that? And yeah, just tell us about that. Um, I believe my art, for me, uh, what I have discovered for myself is that we are, up, we are to be of service. And, you know, when the pandemic hit and when everything else took everything away, what I have left is my art. Um, and so I want to use it in service, serving, soothing, helping, whatever way. That's what I have to give. And um, that, that means a lot to me, you know, yeah. to, to really serve in that way. And I believe as artists, we have a responsibility um, to those whom we serve to be a voice. You know, to give voice to uh, to the, the the feelings, we are able to transmute these feelings through our instruments. You know, and that that's that's something that is more than a notion. You know, uh, so that's why I do that. That's that's it, 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 it's at the core of me. Yeah, it just happens. It, it that's my ministry. You know. So, and, and it's so important um, that we do use our arts in that way, um, because I'm particularly inspired by the artists of the Harlem Renaissance era, you know, the Langston Hugheses and the, the, uh, the Zora Neale Hurstons and the James Baldwins and the Margaret Bonds and the Florence Prices and, and all of those people. And I think that this is forcing us to sort of get back to that and revisit that. Oh, 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And we're here to do, we're here to do that. And I'm, I'm very clear that that is my mission. And it's important to me to do so thoughtfully. Um, and as I spoke to my mother, <laughs> I, we talk about everything. My mother is the biggest support of my craft and my art. And she just is like, where you want to go, we got your back. And that is a big, that is a big, you know, part of why I'm here. And I think God yeah. and my family's support um, because she helps me f figure thing out, figure things out, and talk about it, and discuss it, and make it come to life. So one of the big things now we're talking about is reform, reforming a system, you know, that is um, that is flawed, you know, and it's something that we all can kind of contribute, that we all contribute to, regardless of whatever, you know. Um, so there's. There are just a few questions that I want to pose to my fellow singers, my fellow artists, and as well as companies and administrators, you know, um, because I think now we have to be very clear about how we're going to move forward. We have a chance to be clear and clarify how we're going to move forward. Um, so I'm just going to ask these questions and feel free to write inbox me. Or, <laughs> or whatever. So this is what I, these are the questions I'm posing to myself and to you guys. Um, what are three things that you are doing now to rebuild your career in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of the unrest, in the midst of all of this? What are three things? Something to just think about what are three things you can say that you can do or that you are doing to rebuild your career as an artist? And the next are, what are three things we can do to build our activism? Mm. What are three things? Think about, just mull it over. Think about what are three things we can do to build our activism as artists. And the next thing is, what is one thing you wish opera companies, theatrical organizations, Broadway, would do to be more equitable in their practices. What is the one thing you wish opera companies and Broadways would do to be more equitable in their practices? Okay, those are to my fellow artist friends, everyone who wishes to answer. You know, think about these things as we begin to rebuild and move forward. And this is to companies. What is your commitment to equity? Does your board embrace equity and justice in your mission statement? I would encur I encourage that to happen. Um, and then, and if you want to assemble a group together to put that into motion, I'm happy to help. I'm happy to help with, with that measure. So these are just some questions that I would like to encourage everyone to, you know, question as we think about activism in the arts, as we think about activism, you know, at this time as artists, um, as human beings. So yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Those are great questions. And I'm gonna, you know, apply them to my own self <laughs> when we get off of here and, uh, you know, see how, we as a whole can make it better, but then what is your responsibility? What is your part yeah. in making it better? Um, and I heard, I, heard, I heard Michelle Obama speak today, um, and she said that anger is valid, but if it's not used in a positive way with policy and change as the fuel for that, then it can be destructive. Yes, and so I, I had to take and have to continue to take, because God ain't through with me yet, I have my moments. I have to take the time to use the anger energy and force myself to be positive and force myself to come to the table with solutions, yes, not, that, just, not just criticisms. That's the key. And I was, had a wonderful conversation with my beautiful friend and director, Fenlon Lamb, and we talked about that. We were like, let's what do we do to get these things in motion? We know that, there's, that there are problems. 
So let's answer, let's pose some questions about what the solutions can be. And that's hard to kind of think, we don't know, you know, we're, <laughs> we're downtrodden in some ways, but and so let's have a conversation about it. Let's see let's have a conversation from the muck and mire of all of, of all of our feelings and all of these things. But what comes up that can be productive and how do we begin to hold the companies and all of these people accountable, you know, for for what we want, for the change that we want to see that we desperately need. So absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, well, artists that are in the film, that's what they were a part of, you know. Absolutely. And I always feel like this, this pressure that I put on myself, you know, when I step out there with my art and my activism, I have to think, are they proud of me? Is this something that they would be proud of? Is this something that Paul Robeson and Marian Anderson would say, good job, young man, you know? And so, you know, I had a chance to, to talk with George Shirley at length today, and it was such a beautiful uh, conversation. And he gave me so many amazing nuggets of knowledge and inspiration. Um, and so I'm going to take that energy and, and, and turn it into something positive. And you're one of those artists that constantly does that. And so tell us about the show that you created that we're both a part of called I Too Sing America. How did that come to pass? What is it all about? And how can people find out how to bring it to them? Um, I was so riveted, you know, when Michael Brown died and then Eric Garner died and just, oh, you know, the heart, you know, just your heart just sinks, you know, and it's just, you feel so helpless. And I said, you know, I can transmute those feelings into something tangible from which we all can heal. Um, and there, that, gave, that those feelings gave birth to what is I to Sing America, a lament for the fall. Um, and so I gathered information from things I had seen. I said, we just, let's just call their names. You know, I gathered the juju from the ancestors and I said, let's call their names and acknowledge that we see them and that we lay them to rest in our community with honor and dignity. Um, and let me draw music that is from the activist phases of classical music. That's what, you know, Florence Price and Margaret Bonds, they all were activists in their classical music and in the African-American tradition. And I want people to know that specifically, that that music is, um, they use that music as the, 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 mess, the messenger. Um, so I, I just, we were going to do a, a recital anyway to honor, you know, just to, to honor these, these fallen people. And um, so I just said, let's do this. Let's pull this. And of course, talking to my mother again, she said, you want to have something that means something that really take this, take, you know, someday we'll all be free. That's a powerful song, you know? And so she had her input. And then I just poured out my feelings on paper. Uh, and I wrote my soliloquies that R Rashad speaks. Um, and as you know, you know, as we began to perform it, it shifted. The title changed, you know, a couple of many times, um, as did the content because people kept dying. Um, so it was something that was organic and it had a life of its own. Um, but I wanted to lift that to, the, to those fallen angels because it's something, it was, it was cathartic for me. And I knew that it would be cathartic for all of us who feel that because we all are a part of this society. Um, Absolutely. So, um, fin I think Finland's on here and she's sending love and hugs. And Jasmine Mohammed is here. Uh, and Poom Saleh is here. And uh, David yeah. Huey and Adam Richardson all sending their love and comments. Yes. And Yes, and Finland helped me. She got me a um, technical director who's helping with our presentation and everything. But if you want I Too Sing America to come to you, you can definitely contact me through Instagram, my website, any of it, any of it. And I also would like to say that I do have an album coming out called Love the Color of Your Butterfly. <laughs> and it is being produced by Terion Kelly, who's on here, a Grammy-winning drummer. And we have a wonderful group of musicians who are going to lift on wings some music that is going to heal and continue to heal and transform. And so be on the lookout for that, too. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Do, do we know when it's coming out? Do you have a release date or... 
we have um we're looking at the fall we are looking at okay the fall. so yeah some post summer music so write it down everybody that is janina burnett.com or la janina burnett right here on instagram and you can follow her and then you can also see some of the amazing video footage that she has on youtube um the video for someday we'll all be free is so beautifully done and so inspiring and so i encourage everybody to go out and listen to that and get some inspiration for yourselves while also supporting your fellow artists um and that you know it's something that i love so much about you you have always been so supportive of other artists while doing your art so can you can you impart to the artists that are here how important um that is yes it's important just as i started in the beginning how my wonderful sisters uh encouraged me and took me into the the, the uh practice room to teach me um how to find my voice it is through supporting one another that we can find our own voice you know, so I think it's so important to, to do so. Um, you know, it may not always be easy because we're all going through our own stuff and we're all trying to, you know, work on being these sensory beings. It's not always easy, but just take one step at a time, one step at a time, you know, and yeah, that's just one step at a time. <laughs> And Ticia is here, and she says, lift as we climb. Yeah. And I think that is so beautiful. Thank you, Ticia, for that. And Laquita Mitchell is here, sending yeah. her love and support. And uh, yes, amen. I love you, Janina. Uh, you're getting so much love here uh, in the chat. So just know that all the goodness that you put out in the world, it's coming right back at you in the form of big hugs and hearts. Oh. Um, <laughs> and know that so. Just by being there, just by being present. Absolutely. Absolutely. So before Instagram so rudely shuts us off, um, are there any parting words that you would like to say to the folks? Um, just love yourself. Because if you don't love yourself, how are you going to love anyone else? I know. Exactly. Love exactly. Love on yourself and each other. And so everybody... I just want to publicly thank Janina for her time, for her sisterhood, for her friendship that she has always given to me since we met back in 2002, three, something like that. And um, support her again, JaninaBurnett.com or La Janina Burnett right here on Instagram and continue to join me. Thank you so much for being here and supporting Black Opera Film. Remember to join me here every Monday night at 7 p.m. Uh, at Black Opera Film. And next week, my special guest is Karen Slack. So Yay! tune in for that. Thank you so much, Janina. I love you, love you, love you. Continue to take care and to take care. Love you. Love you. Stay well, stay lifted. Yes. <laughs> Bye. Bye.